Our scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and from Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. You can follow along in the insert on your bulletin if you choose. From Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus sent them. And when they saw him, they bowed down, worshiping him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came and said to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now look. I am with you always to the end of the age. And from Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved them. And out of Egypt, I called my child. They, the Baals, called to them. They went out to the Baals. They sacrificed and to idols. They offered incense. Yet it was I who walked toddling a frame taking them by their arms, yet they did not know that I healed them. I led them with human ties, with bonds of love. I was to them like those who lift babies to their cheek. I bent down to them and fed them. Please pray with me. Creator of all, mother and father of all creation, It is you who have cared for us from the beginning. Though we have given our allegiance to other places, to power and wealth, often worshiping the successful, the rich. Yet we know it is only you who can redeem us from our sins. It is you who can quiet our souls souls, like an infant with its mother. Our souls are like a baby with its mother. You give us hope in all things and for all time. We seek to know you simply as we have experienced your presence. Make us your faithful disciples, revealing your everlasting, steadfast presence in our lives with authenticity, living out your love in us as we love others. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts Be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As this Sunday, that is sometimes known as Trinity Sunday, approached, I found this poem by a poet, someone that I've come to know on Facebook. Um, The poem is called Trinity Sunday, and it's by Marin Tiribasi. Theology for Trinity Sunday. God is like a braid, not a tousled lob. God is like a symphony, not a soloist. God is like a family, any shaped family, steps and blends and chosen, water cooler family and recovery group family, not like a hermit. God is like a soup kitchen where everyone eats together, worker and guest. God is not takeaway. God sounds like the United Nations or a really big airport. God doesn't sound like a national anthem, anyone's national anthem. God is more like prayer concerns than a sermon, anyone's sermon, especially mine. God is like Facebook, oh no, with pictures of dogs and vacations and grandchildren, not a blog. Have you ever looked at the mess, the chaos, the lots of things that is in the Bible? God is like a rambling farmhouse or a trailer park or public housing, all those many, many rooms. God is not like a condo. God is like a baby born in a borrowed cave who flung the aurora borealis, laughed at pterodactyls, and is related to a burning bush who is also a chicken, but sounds like a Santa Ana or Babel turned inside out. Our denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, have a complicated history with the idea of Trinity. God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Creator, Christ, Comforter. 
It's not because we don't recognize the ways in which God has been seen to act over the history, including in the life of Jesus. The complication, as has often been the case, is that sometimes ideas like Trinity, teachings, doctrines, however you want to talk about them, were used to test a person's faith, to see if they got it right. And if you didn't explain it properly, then you weren't right. You weren't right. When the institutional church was being formed after the first couple of centuries, when people were just working out how to tell people about Jesus and to live like Jesus taught, people in authority began to want to define what Christianity was and what it wasn't. Now I'd argue that Jesus defined those who followed him, who understood God's kingdom as those who loved one another and therefore showed that they knew love and therefore knew God. Jesus didn't really emphasize using the right words to explain things, something big and unexplainable, but human beings being human beings, we like to be able to describe our big ideas because otherwise, how do we know who is right and who is wrong? Okay, that's not all it is, but that's part of it. So several hundred years pass and many divisions in Christianity happen. Some churches begin to exist out in the quiet backwaters and grow to follow Jesus' teachings in their own particular ways. There are followers of Jesus who remain very Jewish in their practices. Followers who understand Jesus' teaching in combination with their own particular surroundings and cultural traditions. And so their Christianity looks a lot like the way they've always lived. The largest Christian tradition, particularly in Europe, grew out of the church that was founded in Rome, mostly because Rome itself was for a while the place that ruled and influenced so many other places. But even the church, mostly centered in Rome, had lots of different ideas about what was right and what was wrong, what was this and what was that. So there was an emperor who decided it was best for him if Christianity could be defined more precisely. So he could decide who was right and who was wrong and who was the enemy and who was not. So God was defined. Jesus was defined. The Holy Spirit was defined. And they call those definitions creeds, which means... I believe, the Greek is credo, I believe or we believe. But of course, as time goes on, people argued about what the particular words that defined those particular things meant. So they went back a few times to better define and so on and so on. Eventually, there were so many different kinds of Christianity that people felt they had to test one another to find out if people were the right kind of Christian to walk in their door, into their church, or even be neighbors with other Christians. If you agreed you were in, if you didn't or didn't act properly, then you were out. So you get Eastern and Western Catholicism, Anabaptists, Protestants of all kinds, Lutherans, Anglicans, who can be very Catholic, Roman in some cases. You get Methodists and Baptists and Reformed and Presbyterians. And then after the United States began, you get a few more, including us, the movement that became who we are, the Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ. And the founders of our denomination decided in different ways and for various reasons that each person should figure out if their own faith was authentic. No one else should be able to question them to figure it out or make them define it. Now, that has, isn't always true within congregations, <laughs> but that was the idea. Now, they weren't perfect, these ideas. They just saw this particular problem and tried to solve it. It wasn't just about Trinity. It was about a whole lot of other things, too. Um, but that solution that lets everybody decide their own thing has its own sets of problems. But one of the things that was in question was the definition of the Trinity. They didn't want other people to look at the things that people believed and decided it was wrong. They wanted people to be able to read their Bible or hear the Bible read and decide what it meant for their lives. 
Sometimes that went well and other times it hasn't. Sometimes it's led to too much individuality, which leads to even more division sometimes. The teaching of the Trinity so therefore became a concern for us because it was used to exclude people from community. And at the same time, that idea of Trinity, of multiple ways that God works, is a useful because it helps us know that God works and exists in different ways throughout the way we talk about the history of human beings and God. From the prophet Hosea, we read how God remembers Israel, or Ephraim, which is a kind of nickname for God, like their own child. Even when the child was behaving badly, even in difficult times, like a mother or a father might, God remembers teaching them to walk, holding their arms as they toddled along. God remembers, the text says, while Israel forgets. What an image, and it feels authentic. I doubt if most of us remember our, any, either of our parents teaching us to walk. Big people holding our hands. But it's not really that we forget, it's just that we were so young, usually, when it happened that we didn't really register learning. Our earliest memories probably are after we started walking. Yet, while the comparison to mother or father here is very real, it doesn't completely excuse all people of faith, because even if we don't remember it, we know the stories. We know the stories of how God led the people. They might not remember, we might not remember as God remembers, but we know the stories, how we've gotten here. Sometimes we like to disagree about God's action in the First Testament. Some people like to point at God in the First Testament of the Bible as angry or violent. But God is, like here in Hosea, tender and hopeful, sometimes disappointed and loving, angry or upset, yes, Jesus gets that way too yet always trying to love and hum move human beings to be better. The ways in which scripture speaks of God remind us and all who worship is that God is the source of life, like a mother, a creator, an incubator of life. God is from whom all things flow. And we can read of how God in the New and the First Testament was the redeemer of people. When people got lost, when people were taken without, uh, without their own will, God redeemed them from whatever place they were, whatever feeling they were lost in. As, Christian, we most, as Christians, we most closely identify Savior and Redeemer with Jesus, yet Jesus is also a teacher, a revealer of wisdom, like the wisdom that is described in the book of Proverbs, in the Gospels, Jesus wondered if he could be like a hen gathering her chicks under her wings for protection, like the psalmist described God. We can look at times when God's actions are unexpected or constant or inspiring and describe those times as the movement of the Holy Spirit, the fire of unexpected passion for justice, the rising awareness of understanding or communicating like we celebrate on Pentecost to remind us that the spirit can disrupt our expectations and surprise us. Traditional Trinitarian language to name God probably originates in the gospel lesson we read this morning as Jesus gave the disciples the commission to baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And those are powerful and important ways of naming how we experience God. They relate to us and they relate to each other. And that's important. Biblically, if we read about all of the ways that God is named and described, the language for God is broader and wider and more diverse. We can name God biblically and faithfully 
in different kinds of Trinitarian ways. Sovereign and savior and shelter, author, word, and translator, parent, partner, and friend, majesty, mercy, and mystery, creator, Christ, and compassion, potter, vessel, and holy fire, life, liberation, and love. Those particular things are named by Wilda Gaffney. I believe that what is important about our language of God is that we know that however we talk about God, we know it's limited by our human understanding. We have to know that no matter how we describe or name what God is to us, whether it's traditionally masculine or liberated from traditional understanding with things like mother or lover or even wild goose of Celtic understanding, that the description, the name, the words always fall short of who God is. Father is limited, as is mother, even if father is more often used in the Bible. Because both mother and father are used in the Bible in different ways, and both the names have limits to how it is that they describe God. The majestic glory of God is beyond us. The love of God, while it assures us, goes far beyond any love that we can know for ourselves. The breath we breathe can remind us, but does not really show us the movement of life that God generates now and forever. What we really only know is that we can't know everything. However we understand, or can't understand, we can remember Jesus' words, I am with you always, to the end of the age. To the glory of the one we worship, amen.